A few doors down the street from the parsonage, my neighbors announced about a month ago that they were moving to South Carolina. For weeks, they collected boxes and packed their belongings, and finally, last Friday was the big day. And while I walked my dogs by their house in the morning, a large semi-truck pulled up in front of their house, and three guys hopped out of the semi-cab. While I continued to walk our pups around the block, and about 15 minutes later, as we passed their house, the trailer doors were open, but nothing had been carried out of the house, and the three guys simply met in the middle of the driveway, talking. Well, later, about 30 minutes later, when I left the house, the guys had finally moved out of the driveway, but instead of carrying anything out of the house, they were carrying all kinds of padding and a huge tube of saran wrap into the house. Well, when I returned home for lunch and to let the dogs out, the guys had taken all these pads and the saran wrap, and they had surrounded the entire front door jam and of just about every door in the house with all of these pads and things. And then on every wooden floor, they had placed the saran wrap. Everything looked really nice and tidy. But it also took them a really long time to do. And so my neighbor was standing in the front yard looking a little nervous. And I went over and I said, you're still planning on leaving tonight, right? And she looked at the house and looked at me. And with a kind of nervous smile, she said, I think so. Meanwhile, only a few boxes had been moved out of the house and into the trailer. And then at three in the afternoon, I was surprised to see that the truck was nearly full. And it became crystal clear why the door frames were covered in all of this padding and bubble wrap because every box and every stick of furniture had been placed on hand carts and these guys were literally running out of the house with these hand carts. And about an hour later, the semi was pulling out. I ran over, gave my final blessing and my final goodbye as my neighbor locked her front door for the last time. And I marveled that the door frame and the wooden floors didn't have a piece of damage done to them. Obviously, this moving company had experience. Well, it's too bad David hadn't hired them or even the company two men in a truck when he originally tried to move the Ark of God in the preceding chapter of Second Samuel. And we'll get to that account, but before we do, the Ark of God represented the presence and glory of God, and it contained the broken tablets and the new tablets of the Ten Commandments. It also held the rod of Aaron and a pot of manna, a pot of bread, a reminder of their liberation so that they could trust God to remain with them. After the Ark was constructed, Moses gave a mandate regarding how the Ark was to be transported. It was always covered in a certain way with skins and a blue cloth, thus concealing it when it moved from one location to the next as the Hebrews wandered the wilderness for 40 years. The Levites, the priestly class, were entrusted with moving the ark using two poles that threaded through brass rings on either side of the ark, and then the poles were to be raised and set on the shoulders of the priests. As the Hebrews wandered the wilderness, the ark became linked with miracles. There was the miracle of the Jordan River. Before the Hebrews crossed the Jordan River and entered the promised land for the first time, the Levites simply took the ark into the river, and as they stood there, the water was parted, revealing dry land. Then there was the miracle of falling walls. As the Hebrews entered the promised land, they encountered resistance at Jericho. The priests carried the ark around the city of Jericho for a week, and on the seventh day, the walls came falling down. After the walls of Jericho fell, the ark became a status of military success, and Israel's neighbors trembled in fear, fearing that the ark housed a warrior deity who fought on Israel's behalf. The Philistines, though, discovered where the ark was being housed, and they launched a surprise attack and captured the ark. In the process, Eli's sons were killed, just as the ten-year-old Samuel had predicted. When the ark was captured, Samuel took Eli's place. And many years later, Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. And then 42 years later, David became king. During all that time, 
the Philistines held the ark captive. And when David became king, the Philistines launched an attack against the United Tribes of Israel, but it failed. And at that point, as the Philistines retreated, David realized he had a rare opportunity to fulfill a political ambition, a political ambition that would allow him to solidify his power over the tribes of Israel, and he could assert control over the sanctuary. Thus, he would become the direct mediator between the people and God. David announced, of course, not his political ambitions, but he announced, we are going to go rescue God and bring God home. And he excited the tribes. And so 30,000 people volunteered to go with him to raid the Philistine camps and retrieve the Ark of God. However, David was so eager to bring God home and establish dual power over the political and religious lives of the tribes, he neglected to plan how he would transport the Ark home. So David not only encountered a moving problem, he also neglected to consult with God regarding what God wanted. Because ever since the Philistines had captured the Ark, they experienced great problems related to the Ark. And in a way, if you ever have watched um, Game of Thrones, or if you at least know of Game of Thrones, you, you kind of get the sense that there's something going on over here, and yet there's something going on over here. And if the two sides would just communicate, we'd actually, well, we wouldn't have eight seasons of Game of Thrones. So, But in every city the ark was placed, the people suffered an illness. One resource said that they suffered from something similar to the bubonic plague. And so desperate, even after all these years of having the ark and suffering these illnesses, the Philistines finally become desperate for healing. And so I love it. They offer guilt offerings to the God of Israel. And then they loaded the ark into an ox cart pulled by cows, and the cows were sent with the ark on a road that led to Israel. Well, somewhere along the road, the cows pulling the ark and David and his 30,000 raiders meet. And then David is so eager to return the ark to Jerusalem to unite the separated tribes, he assumed that since the Philistines placed God on an ox cart, then this method of transportation would work for him as well. And so he ordered everyone to return to Jerusalem, and they set out with a large procession leading the way home. But along the road, the cart hit a pothole and the ark began to fall. Uzzah, who had been walking beside the cart, reached out to steady the ark and immediately died. Well, this was definitely a buzzkill for the people and it scared David. Ashamed that he had failed God, David left the ark with Ovid-Edom and retreated to Jerusalem. David was so stricken with regret, he isolated himself so he could wallow in his guilt because David believed his mistake was too heinous to be forgotten or forgiven by God. And no amount of guilt offerings would be sufficient for God to wipe away his guilt for what he had done. David's self-abasing guilt reminds me of the letter-writing commitment of Representative Walter Jones, a Republican congressman from North Carolina. For over 14 years, Mr. Jones has handwritten a letter to every son, daughter, or spouse of someone killed in Iraq or Afghanistan. And his reason for writing is because he has lived with pangs of guilt for voting for the Iraq war in 2002. He told a reporter, I will never forget my mistake because people died because of my mistake. He acknowledges that his conscience told him to vote no, but he voted for the war because of re-election concerns. He said, in my heart, I believe I let God down. And so Mr. Jones views every letter he sends as a personal apology to God and to the families he let down. And he recognizes that the vote he cast is permanent, but he viewed his role in Washington as an opportunity to do the right thing from now on. He vowed that he would never again allow re-election concerns be a reason for how he votes on any topic. And he said he underestimated his moral responsibility 
and he's grateful for a chance to carefully discern God's voice and vote his conscience from now on. Thankfully, similar to Mr. Jones, David had an epiphany that he had forgotten his role as it related to the position and power of God. But David's failure wasn't the end of the story. Rather, it was the beginning of something new. David realized that failure can be a learning opportunity, which is often viewed as countercultural. But here's what failure taught David. Failure taught David that God was bigger than he was, and he needed to let God lead the way, not the other way around. Failure taught David that it wasn't all about him, and he needed to humbly rely on God and to listen to God's directions before he acted. Failure helped David discover that he had still much to learn. See, David had been ego-driven because he thought he knew all the answers. But by incorrectly moving the ark, he learned that he needed to seek wisdom and help those and seek help from those around him. Failure enabled David to see clearly that there were things he needed to prepare for, things to avoid, and things to stand against. And finally, failure revealed God's grace. See, when David left the ark behind, he did so because he thought he had angered God, and he believed that God had removed the promise of the covenant, not only from Israel, but also from David. But about three months later, a messenger visited Jerusalem and reported to David's advisors that the family that was commissioned to care for the ark of God was receiving blessings. And when David heard this report, he realized God still cared for Israel, and he discovered he could start over. But this time, he committed to doing it the right way. He consulted with God and met with the priests. And this time, he only went to retrieve the ark after God granted him permission. In this, David laid aside his guilt and replaced his pain with joy and dancing as he went after God and returned with the presence and power of God and transformed. He remained humble from that point on, allowing God to be God. We are invited to do the same. When we've messed up or failed to listen to God, perhaps even when we've run into brick walls or our pursuits went nowhere, or our search for a better job or a drama-free life encountered dead ends. Perhaps when our pursuits have fallen short, we've felt the pang of shame or guilt that things didn't turn out how we thought they should. Thankfully, God offers us grace and forgiveness so that we can learn from our shortcomings. And healed, perhaps God is encouraging us to try again. This morning, we're encouraged to embrace God's grace and forgiven. We're invited to open our minds and our ears to consult God, asking, Lord, what new opportunities have you made available because of grace? And then listening, let us be willing for God to move us when and how God wants to move us. And let's do it the right way, which is God's way.